Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan and I'd like to welcome you to the sixth webinar in Move Muscle Bone and Joint Health 2017 Musculoskeletal Health webinar series. Tonight's webinar is on the topic of cognitive behavioural therapy and pain. Our presenter for this evening is Dr Jackie Stanford. Jackie is the Director and the Principal Psychologist of Empower Rehab who specialise in providing interdisciplinary pain management as well as working with clients presenting with a range of psychological presentations. Jackie provides training and supervision to health professionals and return to work professionals about the management of clients with persistent pain to help facilitate recovery and optimal function. She is a psychology advisor and consultant to WorkSafe Victoria. Jackie also lectures in Masters and Doctorate of Psychology students in pain management at Deakin University. She's a member of the Australian Psychological Society and the Health College and the International Association for the Study of Pain and the Australian Pain Society. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Jackie. Thanks very much, Jackie. Thanks, Jen. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, present this topic again, looking at cognitive behaviour therapy and pain. Now, before I get started, though, what I'd like to do is to find out a little bit about those um, who's involved and listening at the moment. So I've got a couple of questions for you. First of all, wondering what your primary work role is. Do you work in a solo practice or do you work with a multidisciplinary team? If you can just indicate that please on your computer, that would be great. So obviously this is going to be a one-way conversation but it's always nice to find out a little bit more about who I'm talking to. Okay. So it seems that we have a mix of people who work in a multidisciplinary team and some people who work in solo practice um, with overall more people uh, working in a multidisciplinary team. And really what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how you can use the principles however you work, whatever your experience is. Um, and what you're learning at the moment, how you can improve your skills. For those of you who are working with clients, what percentage of your clients have chronic pain? So again, if you can just indicate that at the moment, whether it's less than 20% of people, whether it's sort of a third of your population, half, indicate that as well. I think it's interesting when you look at what chronic pain is, sometimes that may not be the reason they've initially come to see you as well. And I know for myself as a psychologist, often people will come to me for something such as depression, but pain will be one of the factors that's perpetuating it, whereas for you it might be they're coming for pain or something else. So we've got a real spread here with a lot of people sort of saying about half their clients have pain. Um, with a spread also to saying a few or the majority as well. So as we start talking about pain, pain's complex and we've all heard biopsychosocial, looking at the biological factors, the psychological factors and the social factors that influence pain. I remember hearing someone talking a few years back now, talking about how why do we put it in biopsychosocial? It sort of sometimes can still put the emphasis on the biological factors and they're really important to consider and we need to accept them. But for some people sometimes the psychological factors may be greater and other times it might be the social factors. And even for the one person it can change in terms of which factors are the biggest issue that need to be addressed. And I think the important thing is to realise that for every single person with pain all three of these elements are there. There is always a context to an injury, there is always a context to the pain someone experiences. Sometimes I'll hear people ask the question of whether there are any psychosocial factors influencing pain. Whereas really the question needs to be what are the psychosocial factors? And if you think about it for yourself, think about a time when you've had pain or you've had an injury, whether that's just tripping over and hurting your knee, um, whether you've had any major injuries. Think about the context. Where were you at that time? What was going on? And when you had that injury and pain, what thoughts went through your head at that first moment? Might have been, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I tripped. I can't believe I ran into that. 
Or there could be a thought around they shouldn't have left that there. Someone's left something in your way. Or it might be uncertainty of how am I going to get home? How am I going to be able to carry my bags on a holiday? There could be relief. Wow, that could have been so much worse. And these thoughts, these psychological factors, the context around it is there from second one when someone has pain. There could be emotional response to it. There might be frustration that you have regarding the context or the pain. There could be embarrassment. There might be panic, worry or relief. And so I think when we start thinking about pain from the start of having this context, rather than us just seeing the psychosocial factors come in for the difficult clients or when they don't progress, they're there for each of us. And so when we are assessing someone with pain, we need to gather information related to these areas. Now each of us will have our own training, our own experience that will give us a lens that we look at a client through. But because of the complexity of pain, it is important that we develop a good understanding of each of the areas. At least to know some questions to ask or the questions to ask other treaters to give us a whole picture of person. Now, a lot of physical treaters might use something like the Arebro or the Start Back tool. And these tools are used to screen out the psychosocial factors. And some of them have been used as early as 48 hours post an injury. They can start flagging who is at more risk of ending up with more complex chronic pain than someone else. And interestingly, as health professionals, we're actually not very good at predicting it. There was a study done um, in the United Kingdom where with the start back, some informed physios, some good physios actually were over treating those who were low risk and under treating those who were high risk. And I think one of the things that's important to realise is, and you'll often have friends or clients that might have surprised you with this, they can appear fine on the outside but they might be significantly concerned. Or some people might verbalise all their worries and once they've talked about it they actually move on. But just how someone presents to you won't be a good indicator. The key thing though is if you're using any of these tools or you're recommending someone else uses these tools, the key thing is to then do something different with the treatment. Sometimes people say, yes, I use the Arebra, we work out who's high risk, but we still continue to treat them as usual as we do everyone else. But these tools, when we know that there are significant psychosocial factors present for someone, are going to indicate where they're more likely to end up with a worse outcome. And what we want to do is try and prevent that happening and when it does start that we want to bring in different tools and strategies to minimise the impact on the person. Now this doesn't mean you are going to become an OT, a physio, an osteo and a psychologist and a doctor. You may not treat all the factors but really what we want to do is have an awareness about it so we know who we can link into so we can change the outcome for people. Now, as a psychologist, one of the tools that we use is a formulation. And really what this is, is about bringing together the whole picture, all the different bits of information to help us work out what we need to do about it. And so as a psychologist, we often talk about it being the P. So first of all, what's the presenting problem? Why have they come to see you? And as I mentioned earlier, as a psychologist, they might come and see me for depression for an OT, they might come and see you because you're struggling, they're struggling with some areas of their function. They might come and see a physiotherapist for pain. They might see a doctor for medication. But really you want to know what is it they're coming to see you for. Then what it is, is it's important to get a picture of the past factors. These are the things that have happened before the presenting issue. So these might have predisposed them to end up with the problem they've got, to made it more likely. And it may also be the factors that precipitate and have occurred just prior to the presenting problem. So any of the things that have contributed to where they're at now. Then what you want to do is get a good understanding of what the perpetuating factors are. So these are the ones that are keeping them stuck, maintaining where they're at now. And these again here we can be looking at the biological factors that are perpetuating the psychological and the social factors. And then of course we want to get a good understanding of what the protective factors are. What is helping them currently? So if we look at a client example, you might have a client who's got back pain that's impacting on their work and social activities might be why they've come to see you. And in the assessment from talking to the worker, from talking to um, different treaters, you might get an understanding that yep, they've 
had their injury when they were doing some heavy lifting. They've always been active and like to be busy and they've had a previous back injury. Now, you might first always get this sort of initial picture. Then when we look at the perpetuating factors, so what, these are the ones, as I said, that are maintaining them, that are keeping them stuck. What you might draw out here is they've got concerns that pain equals further damage. They might have concern when they have a flare up of their back pain that that's leading to more problems with their disc. Um, and more damage. And often I find clients aren't specific about the damage. They'll just fear that it's being made worse. They might have concerns that they shouldn't lift things. They've been told not to lift things. I remember seeing a client who a surgeon had said, because of your pain, it's important don't lift anything. Now the problem was the surgeon didn't communicate effectively. They might have said it, but the client didn't hear what things were okay and what things weren't. And so the important thing is when, for all of us, whenever we're communicating, not just what we're saying, but what's been heard by the client. There might be a belief that the person has that they're going to wait for their better before they can go back to work or they can engage in things around the house. There might be some depression, and this might be picked up through one of the screening tools, but it could also be through their hopelessness. They might be making comments like, nothing seems to be helping. I don't think it's ever going to get better. They might be saying that the physio helps release things for a short period of time. And now I spoke, I assessed a client the other day who made the comment, even if I only had a 1% change, that would be helpful. The problem is when you have a treatment that whether it's a physio or talking to a psychologist or anything that only helps for a short period of time, we can often get drawn into wanting to keep seeking that. We want that short term. And if you think about it for yourself when you've been in pain, if someone can give you something that's going to help for a bit, I know I'd take it. The problem is that can decrease your own ability to manage your pain and keep that reliance on someone else. Your client might be saying that they're irritable at home, that their wife and their son are sick of them, they're frustrated. They might report not sleeping well and they might report that they push through on good days and then they crash and can't do anything and they've reduced their socialising with their mates. So if you look at it here, there's a lot of the psychosocial factors that are being picked up on that we're going to need to be able to address. In terms of protective factors, there might be a supportive partner, um, they might have a proactive GP that's driving some things, might be a person who's quite self-disciplined and will follow through. And previously they've been quite functional um, with exercise and social life and things like that. They've got some protective factors there. Now the reason I've drawn an asterisk next to supportive partner and proactive GP is a lot of these factors that can go both ways. And when you're assessing someone, it's important to not just assume something is either protective or perpetuating. For example, I'll have a number of people who might have a supportive partner who want to help out, they do the task that the injured person might have done previously. The problem is that can make it hard for the person to start grading up back into those activities they can feel like they're useless, which can make their depression worse. They can feel like they owe their partner because their partner does everything. And so that can put a strain on the relationship. So generally what I find is with things such as a partner, um, there will be both the good side and the bad side, or the helpful side and the unhelpful side. Same with a GP. Having a GP who's proactive, looking at different options, is such a powerful tool. Obviously what we want to make sure though is that any treatment path is not suddenly jumping from one thing to the other or looking at more tests that we know that when people are sent off um, for more scans that can increase their pain and disability. So with anything, not just assuming good or bad. Some people will say, hey, they're still catching up with their mates, they're still socialising, that's great. That can be a really helpful sign. The problem is if while they're socialising with their mates, they're feeling useless, a waste of time, and feeling like they don't fit in. That very positive thing of staying engaged socially can also add a whole lot of stress and concern as well. So when we pull something together, we can get this picture of the different parts of the person. Now, I mentioned in the predisposing that they've had a previous back injury. What I'd like you to do is indicate whether you think that the previous back injury we do the poll of looking at whether that's a perpetuating factor, so it's maintaining and keeping them stuck, whether the fact they've had a previous back injury is a protective factor, a good thing for them, 
or whether you're not sure which one it is. Let's give you a, a minute now to complete that. I encourage you all to respond. Which one would you go? Perpetuating, keeping them stuck, it's maintaining, it's a problem. Protective, it's going to lead to a better outcome for them. Or you're not sure. Okay, so we have about two thirds of people saying it's a perpetuating factor. We have about 20% saying it's protective and about 10% saying they're not sure. Really, it could be both. And this is where it becomes important to actually be finding out more about it. With their previous back injury, what happened? Did they have a back injury? They had some really good treatment. They it only lasts a couple of months and they gradually got back into things and they're confident that they'll be able to do that again. Or since the fact they had a previous injury, do they believe their back is stuffed and they're going to always have problems with this and nothing's going to help it? So the important thing is to be finding out the details. What is it for them? Sometimes people will say to me, oh, the fact they're not motivated is a perpetuating factor. You really want to draw out with any of these things, what is it specific to this client? that is making it perpetuating and what is making it protective. What about whether this person was a compensable client? Does it make a difference whether they're a private or a work cover client? So another question for you. Do compensable clients do worse with treatment? Indicate whether you think yes, they do worse, no, no different, or you're not sure. So we've got about half of people saying they think yes, compensable clients do worse. And about a quarter saying they don't think they do. And about a quarter saying they don't know. Often what happens is if we have a look at the, the, some of the data that I've seen is going, compensable clients will present worse. They start off worse. They'll report higher levels of stress, higher levels of concern. But when, in some of the research, it will show they can have a similar degree of change. Now, this is when you're talking group data that's collapsing it. And I was talking to a group um, of OCK rehab providers recently and reminded them there's a whole lot of clients who are compensable clients who have a work cover claim who they will never see because they have a work cover claim, they get better and they get on with life. So it's always important to be careful of the stereotypes and assumptions that we've formed. Now, compensable clients have a whole lot of extra factors, though, that need to be considered in the formulation. One, they'll have more people involved in their treatment and their outcome. They'll have an insurer that might be sending them off for an IME. They've got the case manager. They might even change case manager. They'll have an employer. They might have an occupational rehabilitation provider, as well as any treaters, as well as family. And as soon as you get more and more people involved in something, there's more chance that all of a sudden there can be different messages that can make it harder. There might be um, issues for someone in the compensation system where they feel like they're not believed or invalidated. But really, again, something like compensation, it's being careful that it can both be a protective and a perpetuating factor. So for example, there's some, I remember assessing someone who had a really co uh, complicated injury and they said they Insurer had been fantastic. They felt really lucky that they had things funded and they were supported through all of that. And it was actually really helpful for them. Whereas some people will say that the work cover process or the TAC process, the compensable process has actually caused a lot of problems. And for some people, it can be quite complicated. So when we look at what we're trying to do with treatment, the key thing is to remember is we can't change past factors. So whatever predisposed someone or precipitated someone ending up in this situation, we can't change it. But what we can do is we can work towards determining some functional goals. And really what I find helpful is we will set our goals over a six week period. We're clear, we use the SMART goal model, we find that works really well. We won't explain to the client what each of those components are but we'll work towards a goal that is really specific so it's clear when it's been 
achieve, so it's measurable, that it's attainable, um, and we use the R for it being relevant, I think it's important to the person, it's time based. This is really important we find for clients who are quite hopeless, that when they've achieved a goal, sometimes they'll minimise it, but when we can go back and go, hang on, six weeks ago you weren't doing this, that can help them realise they have actually made progress. So when we look at what treatment needs to do, treatment is going to address the perpetuating factors that are stopping the achievement of the goal. So for example, a goal might be to plant the trees in the garden over the next six weeks. And in order to be able to do that, they need to be able to lift. So there needs to be some element of strength and some lifting capacity that they need to be able to achieve that goal. Now as a psychologist, I'm not going to set an exercise plan and strategies around that. So I need to work in with a physical treater to be able to work out how do we progress in this. They also though will need their belief about not lifting to be shifted. If they believe that lifting is bad and dangerous, um, they're going to need that to change for them to be able to engage in that activity. There might be a whole lot of other strategies that are needed as well around how they pace the activities in their day, how they plan out what they're going to do in order to be able to achieve that. Now often what happens with goal setting when we talk to a whole lot of different treaters is sometimes we will set the goals as a health professional of what we think we can achieve. Sometimes what can happen is they end up with the psychology goals, the physiotherapy goals and the OT goals or the medical goals. Rather than going, what are the client goals? When we have client goals, what we can all do is bring our own expertise into helping that person achieve them. If you are one of those people that work in a multidisciplinary team, you have the luxury of being able to communicate with your colleagues. What we actually do at Empower Rehab is we will have the physiotherapist and the psychologist in the room at the same time when we're setting goals. What this allows us to do is allows us to check in on whether it's realistic to achieve it in a six week time period. So for example, with a goal around planting trees, if the person is currently lifting one kilo and the trees they're wanting to lift are 15 kilos, I need a physio's input on whether that's going to be achievable in that time period or what supports or structures are going to be realistic to make that achievable. So it's allowing time for treatment, for setting goals for treatment. Goal setting is treatment. What it does is it gets everyone on the same page. It also creates hope and direction. And I find clients' mood and hope often shifts once some good goals are set. Now when we set goals, we set three goals in different domains. So there may be a work goal, there might be a social leisure goal and a domestic goal. So then when we look at, so that's the framework that I would work with someone. And then if we look at cognitive behaviour therapy. Now this, a lot of people have heard bits and pieces about it and will have, um, what I'm going to do is give you a brief overview to how I describe it to clients. It's often used with mood and psychologists will use it in that way. But it's actually really useful for someone who doesn't have mood issues, who has pain, or for someone who has both pain and mood issues. Now in life, we often talk about situations causing feelings. We talk about it as though you made me angry, the movie upset me, work stressed me out. The problem is that doesn't explain why each of us could be in the same situation and have a different response. What actually happens is situations are interpreted for our thoughts first of all. It's happening again which then our thoughts will influence our feelings and our behaviour and what we end up having is it spirals around. And so when we look specifically at this, our thoughts are influenced by our belief system, our values, our expectations and experiences. So like I said before, our experiences, having experience of a previous back injury could either be protective or perpetuating depending on the thoughts and the beliefs that have developed from that experience. And a lot of these thoughts can be identified through language. So I talk to clients about our language, the words we speak indicate something about what we're thinking about and our thoughts are driven by our belief system. It's really important to understand what someone's beliefs are, not just what they've been told. 
So when I'm assessing someone, they might say, I've been told that um, there's nothing wrong, the scans are all clear and it's fine. But that's what they've been told. I'll then say, what is it that you actually believe? And they'll have their own beliefs because until we shift that, it's going to limit on how much someone progresses. So where they believe pain equals damage, they need a cure. Now, education in itself can change beliefs and there's some good evidence through um, Butler and Mosley and some of their explained pain around the process of good education can change their beliefs which can change pain improve function. The challenge with this is when there's inconsistency in the messages that are being sent. The more consistency um, that there is, the easier that is to shift those belief systems. And again, like goal setting, education is treatment and it needs time. One of the key things to be aware of though that I think can be a trap in this area is sometimes we keep repeating ourselves. The key thing is if it's education, it's not just talking. So we want to make sure that the belief systems are changing, which means we need to know what the current belief systems are so that we can help change them effectively. We also need to be aware of our influence on beliefs. Sometimes we accidentally can create unhelpful beliefs. For example, I remember a client, a physio saying to me, they said to the client, I don't think it's your disc. The problem is the client heard it could be my disc. They hadn't even thought about it. They didn't know what discs were. They had no idea regarding that. What can be more helpful is to talk about what is working well. So the nerves are working well, the muscles are working well, the ligaments, this is what it is, your pain system is sensitised or whatever that message is. So communicate what is rather than what is not. So as soon as you mention what is not, that is what people hear. So for example, in another area, if I was to say to you, I'm not being offensive but blah, 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 all of a sudden there's an offence that's part of what it is. So be aware of what we're saying is not the negative language is more unhelpful. It's more helpful to use our communication in positive language. Similarly, it's being aware of our influence on beliefs around things like responsibility. Things like we might say you should do this exercise three times a week, which is then us telling them what to do rather than explaining in order to get the maximum benefit, I recommend three times a week where then they need to take on that responsibility. Sometimes we can accidentally create entitlement, belief and a sense that they deserve something by the messages we send. So becoming aware of your own language and how that influences beliefs and their thinking. So what as a psychologist I do is I would be identifying these five thoughts and helping them change their thinking. So in cognitive behaviour therapy what we're doing is we're changing the way someone thinks so that their feelings change, so that their behaviour and physiological response changes. So these are five words that I find underpin a lot of clients' problems and distress. The first one is the word should. The word should leads to guilt, frustration and anger and doesn't change reality. Now if you think about it for yourself, I am assuming that you have all done something you should not have done at some point and you all should have done something that you didn't do and doesn't change the outcome. Also, when we tell someone else what they should do, we're often met with resistance. What's more helpful than should is to change it into I would like, I would prefer. So for example, for our client that we are talking about before, rather than saying I should be able to lift or I should be able to plant the trees, I would like to be able to plant the trees, I would like to be able to lift. What it does is it brings it to that first person, that ownership, and it makes it less black and white, it's something that we'd like. And if you think about my comment before around responsibility with exercises, when we say something like you should do this three times a week, we're starting to put that expectation onto someone rather than helping get them to work with you collaboratively to work out their plan. The second common phrase that I pick people up on is the have to. What have to does is it decreases our sense of control over our situation which increases our stress and anxiety. If you think about it for yourself when you've been really stressed, a lot of the things that we do become a have to. I have to do this, I have to go there and even things that are often pleasant and enjoyable when we're too busy become a have to. I have to catch up with friends. What it implies is there's no other option. I think about it if who's in the driver's seat. 
when we're using a whole lot of have-tos, the have-tos, the expectations are in the driver's seat rather than ourselves. Or the pain is in the driver's seat. I have to lie down, I have to take the medication. Whereas really, apart from being born, which we've all done or die, everything we do is a choice. But we choose it based on the consequences. And the problem is for someone with pain, often what will happen is we don't consider both sides of the consequences. And same for ourselves. I might choose to stay up late because I'm having fun, I want to stay up. But in that moment, I'm not choosing to feel tired the next day. The reality is I'm going to feel tired though the next day. So for our client, they might be feeling good, so they choose to go out and plant all the trees in one day, which means they chose a flare-up. Now this can be quite confronting to say to a client, do you realise that you've actually chosen this flare-up? And I will say this to clients, I'll say, no I didn't. Well, hang on a second. How did you think you were going to feel after planting those 10 trees? Well, I thought one was going to be a struggle, so I guess 10 was going to be even harder. Well, I thought one was going to be a struggle, so I guess 10 was going to be even harder. Okay, so passively, accidentally, you've chosen a flare up. So teaching clients to be able to choose based on all of the consequences is a really important thing. Now the problem is, often these clients don't have a good, a perfect choice. Sometimes they're choosing between a crappy and a crappier option. There's no great option where they're pain free and can do everything they want to do. But it's working within the reality they've got. It's accepting their starting position and looking at the choices they make and how that can help them live the life they want to the best way they can. The third word is the word can't. The word can't makes us stuck and stops us problem solving. Now I sometimes have clients who will say to me, okay, so this is about positive thinking. So if I just say I can do it, I'll be able to. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. What's more helpful to do is to acknowledge that it's difficult. So if they feel like they can't cope, it might be instead of saying, I'm finding it hard to cope, I'm finding it difficult to cope. I can't vacuum, I find it hard to vacuum, so I'm choosing not to at the moment because I don't want to flare up. Or I'm finding it hard to vacuum, so I choose to do it little bit by little bit. So it starts bringing these different thoughts in together to change the way someone thinks. Because if you remember, our thoughts influence our feelings, influence our behaviour and physical response, and influence our pain system. They release the cortisol, the stress response, and it can increase our sensitisation to pain, or can release our endorphins, our body's natural painkillers. Then there is the question mark. This often happens the more anxious someone is, and this is when someone's asking a whole bunch of questions. What's going to happen in the future? How long will this flare out last? Why did this one happen? Will I ever get back to what I was doing? All of those questions. Questions by their very nature imply uncertainty, and uncertainty increases anxiety. And often what happens with questions is the person goes from one to another without actually stopping and answering it. Now for any of you who have had young children or been around young children, if you think about it, if kids are asking questions and we don't answer it, they keep going, they'll keep getting louder. And this is exactly what happens for us as well. When our anxiety doesn't feel answered, it keeps asking the question. Now the reality is, as I said, question marks are there because we're uncertain. We don't tend to wake up each day and say, am I a man or a woman? Or I don't wake up and ask if I like coffee. I know the answer to that. And so what we want to do is acknowledge that we don't know. How long will this flare up last? I don't know. What I do know is they pass. Will I ever get back to being I do all the gardening? I don't know. What I do know is I'm going to take it step by step. What that does is it validates the question but allows them to move on to what they can control, what they do know and what they can focus on. And then the fifth one is wishful thinking. Now hope and wish is really important. When we lose that ability to hope, that's what we call depression, the hopelessness and helplessness that comes. The problem is wishful thinking in itself won't change reality. If I to sit here and wish I was a millionaire for a month, it's not going to change my situation. What we need to do is put with wishful thinking is we need action and or acceptance. We need to accept the reality of the situation or anything that's happened in the past. And as we mentioned before, we can't change the past. And then we need to put action in place to look at what we can do in the future. So it might be, 
I wish I had never hurt myself, I accept that I do have pain and I'm going to look at how I can change things going forward. Again, none of these thoughts suddenly make someone's life magically better. But what it does start doing is it changes the way we think, changes the way the pain system works. So again, thinking about this as some of the client examples, they might be saying, I can't lift, I have to be 100% before I can garden again, I hurt myself with things so I shouldn't lift, if I hurt myself again I don't know how I'd cope, why do I have this flare up, I wish I'd go it away, I wish it would go away. And if you have a look there, that will be often a common sentence or two that clients will say to us. And you can see each of those words there. In the first one we've got the can't, we've got the have to, the shouldn't, the uncertainty, the uncertainty around how they cope or the uncertainty around why the flare up's there and the wishful thinking. So I'm going to read it to you in the way the client might express it such as there and then I'll read it to you in the reframed way and see how it feels. So imagine this is what's going through your mind. I can't lift. I have to be 100% before I can garden again. I hurt myself lifting so I shouldn't lift. If I hurt myself again I don't know how I'd cope. Why do I have this flare up? I wish it would go away. Have a think how that feels if that was what was going through your mind. Does it make you feel hopeful or sad, negative or positive, frustrated? Compared with, I find it hard to lift much at the moment. I would like to be 100% before I can garden again but I need to take a small step, one step at a time. I hurt myself lifting so I'm concerned, so I'm going to focus on lifting a small amount and building up my capacity. I'm not sure how I would cope if I hurt myself again. What I would need to do is get some help. I'm not sure why I've got this flare up. I'm not sure what I've done differently. What I do know is I do have pain and I wish it would go away. I've got the pain at the moment and I'm going to put strategies in place to reduce the pain. So think about how that feels compared to the first version. And what clients will say to me is, it feels more hopeful, I feel more empowered, I feel like there's something I can do about it, rather than feeling so completely overwhelmed. Now, as I said before, it's not just the obvious clients, it's not just the ones that appear really depressed or anxious that are going to have these thoughts. It's going to be all of it. Think about it for yourself when you've been injured, what some of those thoughts are that might jump in. These five common thoughts I use with clients, I pick, I notice it in so many people's language that influence it. Now if you use the word should and you function and you live life the way you want to, that's fine. The problem is these words, these thinking patterns can keep people stuck. So that's the cognitive reframing, that's addressing the C part of CBT. Now a key part as well is the behavioural component. And often what happens is people will avoid doing things, or they'll push through, they'll reach for the medication, they lay down, our client we're talking about if they see the physiotherapist, they might use heat, they start avoiding or reducing their social things. The problem is the more we avoid something we're scared of, often the more scared we get. When we push through, we know that can lead to a flare up and so then we end up with more pain so then we avoid. And so what we want to do is look at how we can change behaviour so that it moves, changes that triangle into a more positive and helpful direction. So many of you might have heard the term grade exposure. Basically that's starting at where someone's at and taking it step by step to help them move forward. Now the important thing with grade exposure is you go at a level they can manage on each area. So for example, if someone is deconditioned because they haven't been doing much, their muscles are going to be weak. Their central nervous system might have become sensitised and they might be really anxious. When you're doing great exposure, what we want to do is start at the level that is manageable for the muscles, the central nervous system and the anxiety. And if we start at that level, what we can do is make gradual progress that will then end up working in to help the muscles build their strength, desensitise the nervous system and decrease the anxiety. So it might be starting off lifting a small amount with a weight. He might be then moving it to a more functional context. I always find it interesting when I have clients who but go, I go to the gym and I can lift 10 kilos but you give them a box and they struggle with 2 kilos. 
because they see the box as scary and threatening. And then moving it into the context of the garden where it's moving it into that to help them achieve their goal. One of the challenges of medication is people often withhold it until they're desperate. Now, any of it, if it's within the prescribed amount, can look at how that person takes it and communicate with the, treat, with the prescribing doctors around what the options are. And what I'll often look with clients at is how can we get you taking it within the prescribed amount, but take it before the panic sets in, before they're desperate, before they're overwhelmed, when they've got a whole lot more stress and negative thinking coming in that just makes it even harder for them to cope. So looking at making the medication more useful. Relaxation. Now, I remember when I first started working in this area, the way we would do relaxation is we would get people to lay down in a darkened room, put on some relaxing music and do some breathing exercises or relax their muscles. The problem is that doesn't help the person when they're out in the garden, lifted the tree and they feel an increase in pain. It doesn't help someone when they're working, walking into a work meeting and they're concerned about how they're performing at work. It doesn't help when they're in a social situation, they get an increase in pain. What we want to do with relaxation is to make it more functional. Take it into the goals that they've got. And so now the way we run our relaxation is we will get the people walking around while they're using some breathing strategies or to relaxing certain muscles. We will get them doing it in relation to their goals. We still recommend people practice regularly to build the skills. Because the problem is a lot of the time people reach for their relaxation when they're in panic stage and they're completely overwhelmed. What we want to do is build the skill and the mastery when they're in a pretty good position so they've got a chance to apply it to higher and higher levels of pain or higher and higher levels of anxiety. So to get that baseline skill, what we know as well is if someone's using relaxation on a daily basis, it actually can increase their capacity to function as well. And again, Relaxation and mindfulness that many of you all have heard of are strategies that you can all be getting your clients using. There's a whole lot of apps available um, that people can use to give them that guide. But really what you want to be able to do is to make sure though that it's functional, that they're using it themselves, they're not fully reliant on someone else to do it for them. And then before I talk about the where to from here, the other key component of cognitive behaviour therapy is their emotions. Now if we change someone's thinking and change their behaviour, their emotions will change. But it's also important to validate emotions and it might be looking at how they either express their emotions and find a safe time and place to be able to do that. It might be learning how to be mindful of emotions, to tune into them and notice them, so to notice the sadness. When I work with clients with pain, one of the topics I often talk to them about is grief. People with pain don't actually have it acknowledged that what they're doing is they're grieving. There's a whole lot of sadness around what they've lost. We talk in our society about grief associated with bereavement rather than grief associated with loss. Loss of independence, loss of feeling strong and capable, loss of identity or roles, and those things can come with a whole lot of sadness. Sometimes simply by us acknowledging as health professionals that hey, you've got a whole lot of loss that's gone on, it's a whole lot of grief, that validation can serve to help them validate it themselves and actually help with that emotional processing. So, the where to from here. For those of you working in solo practice, bringing in each of these different strategies to your own role can help to a degree, but where possible creating links and establishing collaborative treatment with other people in solo practice can be helpful. Now I regularly get asked, do you know any psychologists that work in this area, any physios? There's more and more of us starting to emerge, but there's actually not a lot of us out there. So it's as you start finding those people, really if you can find someone though who has some understanding around how pain works and can set collaborative functional goals, you're going to be on a great track. And a lot of clients can do well with that collaborative treatment between different practitioners. When someone's got more complex pain that's been going on for a long time, when there's more significant sort of psychological sort of factors going on, it can be more important to get them linked into a multidisciplinary clinic where the treatment is integrated. And from my experience of working in a multidisciplinary clinic where it's quite solid, 
I personally find it works really well to have that interdisciplinary where you really are working on the same goals um, rather than just collaborating. Now I mentioned earlier the Arebro and Start Back tools that can be useful risk screening tools. Um, if you get your clients further down the track, looking at who your referrers are and seeing if they can use these earlier. We work with employers directly um, to look at some employers to get them to work out early on the first few weeks, how do we work out those people that aren't going to do well and let's change how treatment is done at that point. The Explain Pain book and training course, a whole of resources by Noy Group and Butler and Mosley. Um, and we also run a two day pain management workshop that looks at how basically expanding what I've talked about in the last hour over two days. Now hopefully those, uh, all that information is helpful. Please add any questions you've got and thank you for listening. Thank, thank you very much Jackie. That's, it's such an interesting and important area so um, I think that's really given people uh, a lot of uh, food for thought in relation to how much how they might approach working with their clients and so on. We have got a couple of questions that have come through and I urge um, other people to, to uh, list their questions now as we will finish strictly at, uh, at 8 o'clock tonight. So um, there was a, a just a, uh, a an ask for a sort of further explanation around um, the fact that people can find being in social situations uh, as potentially causing more stress. Um, there was just a request that if you could expand on that a bit further, um, rather that sort of thing um, being a protective factor, that it can actually be a perpetuating factor. So if you could expand on that further. So it really is finding out what their experience is in that social situation. So if someone's sitting out with friends and the whole time they're feeling like they don't fit, they can't participate in the way they used to, I've got nothing to talk about, I haven't done anything all week, um, all of that stress and concern might undo the benefits they have of getting out. So it's not to say to then avoid using those social situations as part of treatment, it's looking at how you help someone with their thinking use that social situation to their advantage. So it might be they go for a little bit of time because one is the thoughts they might be having, the other is they might be enjoying themselves but they stay for five hours standing up and flare up considerably and that then becomes a perpetuating factor. So rather than just seeing social as either good or bad, you want to get a picture of what's happening. And sometimes what I find happens is health professionals might say, oh fantastic, it's so good you're still going down to the footy club even though you can't play anymore, it's so good to stay involved. But if that person is feeling utterly miserable and useless, that's not going to add the benefit. So it's looking at what's going on in their thinking, how we can change that and help them participate. I'll often work as a psychologist in helping people come up with what response they get, they're going to give people. So if they go to the footy club and someone says, oh wow, how are you going, how's your back going, is it improving? That can cause a whole lot of anxiety for clients about how they're going to respond. Whereas if they can have a tool of saying, hey I'm getting there, it's good to be down here, um, and how are you going can actually be a useful tool that can take that pressure off. So we want to use social experiences and social engagement to help with depression and anxiety and to help with pain, but we need to be making sure that we don't just see something as simply good or bad. And Jackie, someone's just making a comment about the sort of what potentially well, the negative statement of, of someone, a client saying, I know, I know this is going to make me worse. So how would you deal and respond with that? Yes, it's a challenge. I've got a client that just came to mind in terms of that. They know that um, as they increase their weight, they're going to have more pain. And the reality is they do know it because every single time they've increased the weight, they've had an increase in pain. The key thing is don't get into an argument or debate because you won't win it, firstly. It's going, you know what, based on your experience today, yes, this has led to an increase in pain. So what we need to do is we need to look at what other things we can put in place so that it doesn't. Whether that's starting at a lower level, whether it's bringing in some relaxation, whether it's changing I know this is going to make me worse to I am concerned it's going to make me worse. We don't want to go so far and unbelievable to this won't make me worse. If they believe it's making me worse, simply changing the words to it won't, won't convince them. I'm concerned this is going to make me worse, I've been told it won't so I'm going to use A and B while I do it to see how I manage. Key thing is 
if you find you're just repeating yourself relates to someone's concerns, you're not shifting them. So find out more. Why do you know that it's going to cause, why it's going to make you worse? What are your concerns? Interesting as well, when someone's concerned about it making them worse, what do they mean by that? Because it might be just an increase in pain is what they're concerned about. They might be concerned about damage. I've had clients who are concerned they're going to fall because they're going to have an increase in pain, more damage, they're going to get bullied at work, they're going to end up depressed, they might end up suicidal and not being able to care for their kids. And that's genuinely what their brain does in about 10 seconds whenever they have an increase in pain. So you want to find out more so you can be helping address the specific concerns. We also just have someone um, uh, endorsing the uh, the Noi, Noi Group's uh, resources and um, some of the, the, the tools that they have on offer. So um, again, you know, just uh, in, uh, endorsing what you said, Jackie, about the uh, work of Butler and Mosley uh, and some of the things that they have on offer. I mean, they, they are sort of considered world ex experts in the field, aren't they? Yep, and they're always innovating. There's a new clip that's come out recently as well that's just another great way of explaining pain and things like that. So heaps of resources they have, strongly recommend them. Um, and just to uh, respond to, yes, sir, everyone will receive a copy of the PowerPoint presentation tonight. Someone's also asking about, uh, they're actually starting a new business that's focused on active rehabilitation with physios and exercise physiologists. They're wanting to include group education sessions, such as informal peer education, learning from each other. What do you think about this? And do you think that they need to have a psychologist involved? It depends on what you're wanting to achieve. But I think if you have a good active rehabilitation approach with physios and exercise physiologists, there's going to be a significant percentage of the population that you can get a good outcome with. Where you where though, and we have a number of physiotherapy clinics who are really good physio clinics who will refer to us when they're getting stuck. So one is if you can get a psychologist involved that's going to give you a greater percentage of things that you can address um, until that point or if you decide not to go that way, it's, I'd really recommend choosing at what point you refer on. So I think sometimes as health professionals we can get excited by these incremental gains Whereas we see people for 10, 12 times to get a really significant shift in functioning. It shouldn't take long if, and there's my should, it shouldn't take long if you're addressing the key issues. So with good um, physio and exercise physiologists, if you're addressing the main concerns, you can reassure and get them moving, you'll get a great outcome. If you're not progressing, that's when I'd be saying you need a psychologist. In the same way as a psychologist working in this area, I can get a reasonable outcome with someone's functioning, but there'll be a point where I need other people involved. <clears throat> um, just the other thing, sorry, with that is peer education. So I think as health professionals, a lot of education we can provide, and we know that education changes belief, it changes thinking, can change outcomes. I think when you're, if you're talking about peer education as client to client, that needs to be um, moderated really well. I've seen it done well and seen it done badly. Uh, yes, that was a good uh, good pick up there, Jackie, in relation to um, just commenting on the peer education. Um, also, uh, an audience member is just sort of commenting about, you know, for her own personal experience with regards to having back problems and how uh, the message tonight has been beneficial to her in a personal sense with regards to sort of thinking about how turning the, the negative to the positive. Someone's also asking about using the Arebro. Um, to only predict long long disability, long term disability, yep. or can you use it as an outcome measure pre and post? I wouldn't say it's a useful outcome measure. Some people use it as one, but it's designed as a risk screening tool. To me, I think it's more important for pre and post is set some goals, have they achieved them or not, is probably more useful. Now, a lot of people might use something like the um, brief pain inventory as a pre and post to see the levels of pain reported. Um, and the impact on function, and that might be combined with something like the DAS um, that looks at mood. And that's where it's really going. Are you wanting it for the client's outcomes for their feedback? Then achieving their functional goals is the outcome they want. Um, if it's for your own review and process, the um, Arebro and Start Back, my understanding, are designed as risk screening tools, um, whereas EPOC is the national database that's been set up to look at outcome measures and benchmark um, pain management clinics against each other. And they have a range of outcome measures that are being accepted as the standard ones um, across Australia. 
So they could be, if you're wanting to look at outcome measures, that could be a good way to do that um, across Australia. So they could be, if you're wanting to look at outcome measures, that could be a good way to do that hopefully as a country more and more of us um, are using the same one so then at least we're talking the same language. Moving along, given that we've uh, um, sort of only got a few minutes left, um, if, the, if the client is stuck or if the psychologist themselves feels stuck, is it time to reassess the functional goals? Definitely. To me, with the formulation, one of the things that I do um, is if someone's not progressing as I think is needed, it means you're missing something. You're not hitting the problem and it could be that the problem might be that the goals are no longer meaningful or important to the person and they set them because they should set them. Or it might be that there's something else going on. And so more importantly than just reassessing the goals would be to um, re-look at the formulation. And so have, yeah, look at your formulation, what factors are there and what needs to be addressed. And probably just about our last question, um, someone's asking about Michael Moskovitz counter-stimulation of the brain. Um, what, what do, you, do you know of that and, and what do you think of it? Not familiar enough to give any comment, unfortunately. And just, and just one last point from me, Jackie, you sort of said the importance of education, not just talking. So I think just to finish on a note, um, just sort of re-emphasising that point um, for health professionals to be aware of, of how they, they speak with, with people in that sort of more with an education focus rather than sort of just talking at, the, at their clients and patients? And it can be really helpful in that to be saying to the client, what are, what's your understanding of what I've talked about? Um, how about you go and try and explain to a family member and come back with any questions? Normalising questions. So if I give someone education, I'd say, what questions do you have? Not, do you have questions? Or does that make sense? Which I think is one of the really bad habits a lot of health professionals do when they give information, does that make sense? And it's very hard for a client to say, actually, no, I'm completely confused. Most of them will just go, yep, even though it makes no sense to them at all. I, th I think that's a very, a very good message. And, and as I said before, there's so much uh, so much to think about in this webinar. And, and Jackie, thanks. I really always enjoy watching your web webinars. They're so fascinating, but so important. So look, on that note, I would like to sincerely thank you again for a great presentation tonight. I'd like to uh, thank people for joining the webinar this evening and ask if you just take a moment to respond to our exit survey um, and alert you to our next webinar which will be held at the end of August and will be about the role of footwear in the self-management of knee osteoarthritis with uh, Professor Rana Hinman from the University of Melbourne. So on that night, good night everyone and thank you. <laughs>